USSF selects its next rocket providers, major achievements by the French rocket company Latitude, SpaceX tests its flown booster for reuse on the next flight, FAA is closing mishap reports for Blue Origin and SpaceX, new boosters for Ion 6 and Big C, Thales Alenia delivers Lunar Space Station parts, Rocket Lab completed a significant milestone for his neutron rocket, James Webb's latest discovery on Neptune, launches of the last two weeks. Hi everyone, I'm Christophe Paget for All About Space and this is your Space Update. The United States Space Force has released the winners of the latest Phase 3 Lane 1 and 2 awards of firm fixed price contracts of its national security space launch covering the launches up to 2029 but extendable to 2034. Now there were five winners, SpaceX, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy with an order for $5.9 billion. United Launch Services, Vulcan Centaur for $5.4 billion, Blue Origin, New Glenn for $2.4 billion, Stockspace, Nova and Rocket Lab Neutron Rockets for $5 million each to start with, called Task Order. Lata is a big boost for Nova and Neutron for supporting military payload deployments during their development phase. The French rocket company Latitude has been working on its Navier engine for its Zephyr rocket. This week, it has tested south of Paris its pressure-fed engine for 10 second duration. It was the flying version of its Navier engine and therefore Latitude was going slowly into expanding its performance envelope. As the rocket engine is the most difficult and time-consuming part of the development, Latitude has clearly made a significant jump towards a flyable rocket, planned for later this year, according to Latitude. At Starbase, to everyone's surprises, the booster number 14 was rolled out from the production site and headed to the launch site to be installed on the launch mount number 1 and carried out a static fire. Now, this booster has already flown on January 16th and was caught by the Mechazida arms SpaceX mentioned that they only replaced four Raptor engines out of 33, a great progress in reusability. Now, Elon Musk also mentioned that the booster number 14 shall be used on the next Starship flight test, that's the number 9. The booster was then returned to the construction site. The launch mount number 2, the flame trench borders were filled with metallic walls. And in the meantime, booster 17 was rolled out to the Massey site for cryogenic testing and has indeed started its test campaign with so far two lots of cryogenic fluid loading. At the production site, Starship number 36 is more or less assembled, but its thermal protection layer is still being worked out. However, the ship looks like Frankenstein right now. Starship number 37 is starting assembly at the Mega Bay. The nose cone of the Starship number 38 is getting its tile installed. Inside the Star Factory, a structure was being assembled, the same one which underwent cryogenic tests at the McGregor site with a diameter of 3.5 meter and being prepared for structural tests at Massey site. I have some ideas of what it could be, but I would rather not speculate in this channel. And the high bay demolition continues, as previously mentioned, along with the Stargate building, which was at Starbase before SpaceX took over the site many years ago. So all that to make place for the Gigabay. At Cape Canaveral, SpaceX is also starting the Flame Trench dig on his Launch Complex 39A, looking very similar as the one on Starbase Launchpad number 2. The Federal Aviation Administration has just mentioned that it has approved Blue Origin's mishap report content and is mitigation actions over the failed landing of its New Glenn first stage back in January 16th this year. To refresh your memory, during the inaugural flight of the New Glenn rocket, the second stage and its payload have reached all their goals, whilst the first stage failed to land on the landing platform Jacqueline. The final mishap report identified the proximate cause of the mishap as an inability of New Glenn's first stage to restart the engines, 
preventing a re-entry burn from occurring and resulting in the loss of the first stage, the FAA said in his statement. Seven corrective actions were identified, focusing on propellant management and engine bleed control improvements, which Blue Origin said it has already addressed. Blue Origin also mentioned that his next New England launch will be as soon as late spring. The FAA also mentioned that it has approved the mishap report from SpaceX relating to the flight number 7 of his Starship number 33 and booster number 14 back in January 16 as well. Now, the booster returned to the launch site and was caught by the Mechazilla arms while the Starship exploded in space. And the final mishap report cites the probable root cause for the loss of the Starship vehicle was stronger than anticipated vibrations during flight led to increased stress on and failure of the hardware in the propulsion system, the FAA stated, which is what SpaceX has mentioned some time ago. SpaceX needs to understand the reasons for its previous Flight 8 mishap on March 6th before it can be granted a return to flight determination, according to the FAA. So we will have to wait some time until Flight 9 can take off. Both Ion-6 and Vega-C rockets use the P-120C solid stage manufactured by Europropulsion, a joint venture of Avio and Ion Group. ESA has commissioned Europropulsion to improve the performance of its booster and the P-160 was born. Compared to the P120C, the P160C has 14 more tons of propellants, is 1 meter taller and can run for over 2 minutes, allowing up to 2 more tons of payloads or farther away orbits. It will be used on Ion 6 Block 2 version as well as Vega C and future Vega E rockets. This booster prototype is the qualification hardware. It was received at the European Spaceport in the French Guiana last year and is now filled with propellant and about to be tested on his engine test stand under the control of the French space agency CNES. Last week, I've mentioned that Thales Alenius Space was responsible for manufacturing the prime structure of the habitation and logistics outpost of the Lunar Gateway space station subcontracted by Northam Grumman. Now, the specimen finally arrived in Mesa, Arizona. The next step now is to transport the structure to Northam Grumman's facilities in Gilbert for final outfitting. Now, once complete, this module will be launched together with the power and propulsion element on board a Falcon Heavy rocket at the end of 2027. Now, the Habitation and Logistics Outpost module will provide Artemis astronauts with space to live, work, conduct scientific research and prepare for missions to the lunar surface. It will offer command and control, data handling, energy storage, electrical power distribution, thermal regulation and communication and tracking via Lunar Link, a high-rate lunar communication system provided by the European Space Agency. Now, the module includes docking ports, for visiting vehicles such as the NASA's Orion spacecraft, lunar landers, and logistics modules. It will also support both internal and external science payloads, enabling research and technology demonstrations in the harsh deep space environment. Rocket Lab's latest rocket, Neutron, has had its second stage qualification tests completed, applying cryogenic loading on its carbon composite structure under flight-like conditions and even 25% above the maximum dynamic loads. Now, this is a great achievement, especially when Rocket Lab still expects its neutron maiden flight to take place in the second half of this year, a very challenging milestone. So good luck to Rocket Lab. The James Webb Space Telescope has just revealed something that Hubble could not. The planet Neptune on the left did not show during decades of observation signs of magnetic field capturing the sun energetic particles, also known as aurora. However, thanks to James Webb, auroras were finally detected, pictured in cyan colors, on the right-hand side picture, which was not located at its poles, but rather towards the center due to Neptune's magnetic field 
tilted by 47 degrees from the planet's rotational axis. It was such a beautiful sight that I wanted to share that with you. As a bonus, James Webb was also able to pick up some white clouds. March 29th, CSC launched a Long March 7A from China for its mission TJSW-16, a traditional communication satellite in geostationary orbit. March 30th, ISA Aerospace launched its Spectrum rocket from Norway for its maiden flight, being the first European rocket company to launch an orbital rocket in continental Europe. Unfortunately, the rocket failed to reach orbit. I have covered that flight in a dedicated video linked in the description. March 31st, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from Florida for its Starship Mission Group 6AT. The first stage flew for its 17th time and landed on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. April 1st, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from Florida for the Mission Fram 2. This is a private mission with a Dragon capsule paid by a cryptocurrency billionaire with 22 experiments on board and for the first time astronauts have flown over the Earth poles, a dangerous area due to high electromagnetic field. So the first stage flew for the sixth time and landed on the drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas. On the same day, CSC launched a Long March 2D from China for a mission with four satnet internet technology test satellites. And April 3rd, CSC sends a Long March 6 from China for his mission, Jiangping 3A02. The satellite was designed to calibrate ground-based radar equipment. April 4th, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from California for a Starlink mission group 1113. The first stage flew for the fifth time and landed on the drone ship, of course, I still love you. April 6th, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from Florida for a Starlink mission group 672. The first stage flew for the 19th time and landed on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. April 8th, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from California for a Starlink mission group 1111. The first stage flew for the first time and landed on the drone ship. Of course, I still love you. And on the same day, Roscosmos launched a Soyuz 2.1A from Kazakhstan for the crew replacement mission MS-27 bringing to the ISS the Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Rizikov and Alexei Zubritsky, as well as the NASA astronaut Johnny Kim. On April 10th, CSC launched a Long March 3BE from China for his mission TJSW-17, another traditional communication satellite in geostationary orbit. In summary, from January 1st until April 10th, 2025, 73 rockets were launched successfully. Out of that, 46 were from an American company or institution, 19 from China, 5 from Russia, and 1 from Europe. I leave you this week with a very recent picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the star cluster NGC 346 in the small Magellanic cloud, one of the largest of the Milky Way satellite galaxies, 200,000 light years away in the constellation Tucana. This picture was taken to celebrate the 35th anniversary of Hubble, featuring new data and processing techniques. Now, what is the novelty? Well, this picture combines, for the first time, the infrared, optical, and ultraviolet wavelengths into an intricately detailed view of this vibrant star-forming factory. Now, it is home to more than 2,500 newborn stars. Using two sets of observations taken 11 years apart, researchers traced the motion of NGC 346 stars, revealing them to be spiraling in towards the center of the cluster. Thank you for watching your channel All About Space. See you at the next episode of Space News.